Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. It's very early for some of you, very late for others, and we thank you for that. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of the Glossal and Soil Spectroscopy webinar. My name is Isabel Verbeck from the Faust Global Soil Partnership Secretariat. Our today webinar will present the definition and role of soil spectroscopy for laboratory and field measurement, and we reflect on possible novel approaches. Before starting, I would like to remind you that the session is organized in a webinar format in which participants cannot activate their audio and camera. This meeting uh, is recorded and recordings and presentation will be uploaded on the Glossolan uh, webpage. Uh, we invite you to post your question in the Q&A box, which will be moderated by the colleagues. In addition, there is also a chat box that is already very active. Uh, it's available and can be used for interaction between participants. Please use the chat responsibly. For any technical issues, write to me on the chat and I'll be happy to help. I would like also to invite you to our newly uh, created Facebook group, the Glossolan Soil Spectroscopy Forum. So before explore, exploring the future for soil spectral interf uh, inference with our renowned speaker of today, I would like to give first the floor to my colleague Yi Peng, who will provide you with a bit of background on the GSP, the Global Soil Partnership, and Glossolan. Yi, you have the floor. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Yi Peng. I'm from Global Soil Partnership, FAO. Uh, probably some of you already know me before because this is already the third webinar. Uh, this, uh, I, the next few minutes, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, who are we and why we organize this uh, webinar. We are global, uh, all the webinar are organized under the framework of the Global Soil Partnership. Global Soil Partnership, normally we call GSP. GSP is established in uh, 2012 to position soils in a global agenda through collective action. Our main objectives uh, is to promote sustainable soil management and improve soil governance to guarantee health and productive soils. All of our activities are downscaled through seven regional soil partnerships. Since we are partnerships, so our activities are also supported by the, our partners and under the guidance of the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils. As you can see, we are working with, uh, we work with a wide range of uh, topics. For more information, you are very welcome to visit our website. On the, on the top of uh, all these uh, work, uh, subjects, we also have a different uh, network, such as, such as a Global Soil Laboratory Network, Glossalum. Glossolon established in 2017 to build and strengthen the capacity of uh, laboratory in soil analysis and to respond to the needs for harmonizing soil and ethical data. Glossolon started to work on the chemistry, wet chemistry analysis, focusing on training harmonization of standard operating procedures and the, the execution of inter-laboratory comparison. Last year, we launched the Growth Loan Initiative on Soil Spectroscopy, also launched the International Network on Fertilizer Analysis. For more information of these two initiatives, you are very welcome to visit Growth Loan website, also write email to me or to my colleague, Lucrezia. Since last year, we launched this uh, Growth Loan Soil <laughs> Spectroscopy Initiative, and the main objective of this uh, initiative uh, and soil spectroscopy is to develop national capacity in soil analysis. That is why we decided to start organizing a series of a webinar due to we have a many uh, different background of the colleagues. Some of them in a very advanced level, some of them uh, don't know that, don't have that much knowledge on a soil spectroscope. So the first uh, two webinar, if you attend, you, you, you knew the first two webinar are mainly introduce what is this technology, and what we, what we can do with this technology in a real application. And the third one today, we invite our, our guest the speaker to give some future pers perspective of this technology. 
And after this webinar, the fourth and the fifth will mainly introduce the experience of the soil spectral library from France and the Brazil, because one of the most often asked questions from the countries are how to build a soil spectral library and how to use a spectral library. The last speaker of uh, the last webinar of this series of the uh, webinar will be given by the eye open door and he will mainly talking a little bit about the measurement. But this is just the beginning of our uh, webinar and next year we are currently pre preparing uh, other webinars for next year so uh, so please regularly check our website. You will have more information in a, on the soil spectroscopy and the coming webinars. And the, the last two webinars uh, presentation and the video recording already online. So please also feel free to visit our website. Now I, now I would like to introduce uh, today our, the speaker of the today, Professor Alex McBrantley. Has, he has been a practicing soil scientist for more than 40 years. I think in my generation of the young soil scientists, uh, almost all of us grew up with his knowledge. I have to say now, uh, if you, if you have, uh, haven't read his uh, publication, I don't think you learned enough of the soil knowledge. He works on the pedometrics, digital soil mapping, digital agriculture, and the soil security. He always tries to develop new ideas to better understand and manage soil. Alex and uh, his colleague at the University of Sydney have been working on soil spectroscopy as a way of uh, efficiently generating new soil data and information for more than 20 years. In the meantime, I also would like to introduce another panelist today, Professor Budiman Minasni, speaker from our last webinar, also Dr. Alexandra Wodox. Dr. Jose Padarin and Dr. Edward Young, all of them from University of Sydney and have intensive experience in soil spectroscopy and spatial modeling. They will be here to help us today and answer some questions in the QA session. So please feel free to post your questions in the QA box. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Alex. So Alex, floor is yours, please. Isabel and Yi, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on whether you're in the, the Americas, the Car Caribbean, Europe, Asia, or, or Oceania. So welcome to you all. And I, I say a special welcome to all the colleagues whom I know and who've worked with over the years. Just waiting for my uh, screen to pop up. I'm trying to share my screen, but oh, it's coming. It's coming soon. Don't worry. Hopefully, it will appear, and uh, we can get going. I'm waiting for that. Here we go. Can somebody give me a wave and tell me that's okay? Everybody can see that. Thank you very much. So this is the third web webinar in this Global Soil Laboratory Network series. And I thank the Global Soil Laboratory Network and the Global Soil Partnership for inviting me to, to give this uh, webinar today. Um, before I do that, I need to um, do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation the traditional custodians of the land from which we are webcasting this presentation. We recognize their continuing connection to soil, land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. So I'm giving you this seminar from Sydney, Australia, where we've been in lockdown for the last 14 weeks, which is why my hair is a bit long and I can't go to the hairdresser to get a haircut. So I apologize for that. Um, hopefully in a few weeks, we'll be able to go and get a haircut. So today I'm gonna to talk about a future for soil spectral inference. And, may, and we'll try and explain what some of these uh, words mean. Um, 
and I'll also acknowledge that myself and my colleagues are, are from the University of Sydney here in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. And we have just acknowledged several contributors to this. So the work, or the, not so much the work, but the ideas that we're, uh, we're talking about today, we've had lots of contributors, um, Mario and Ed, Brendan, Budiman, Guartini, Jose, Uta, and Alex. A couple of them have joined CSIRO, but we, we continue to work on this topic and we plan to work on this topic for a lot longer. Um, so if we have a look at our research farm up in northern New South Wales, beautiful vertisols. Um, this is a real picture, a real pedoglyph. So the word soil there is real. It was created by digital agriculture, if you like, just to, we did that for World Soil Day a couple of years ago. And really what spectroscopy is about, how can we go out into that landscape and efficiently map out, gather information about the soil and its condition? And that's really what the hope of digital agriculture, hopefully very efficiently, perhaps without even sending any samples back to a laboratory. So the goals of today's uh, webinar are partially didactic. In other words, I, I'm going to teach you a few things uh, which you might know or you might not know. And it's partially prognostic. In other words, we're going to make some guesses about the future. Um, and they probably are just guesses. Um, before I get into it too much, um, I've just got a, one recollection. Um, I'm getting to that age where I start telling stories about the past. Um, so about 20 years and two weeks ago, exactly 20 years and two weeks ago, so that's roughly September the 11th, 2001. It's one of those dates where people remember where they were that day. I happened to be in the Midwest of the United States that day at, a, at one of the leading universities there giving a seminar. And I recall very vividly that part of that seminar, I talked about mid-infrared reflectance spectroscopy and how that would be the future of routine laboratory analysis. So that was 20 years and two weeks ago. Um, so what do we learn from that? Well, we'll, we'll learn a couple of things. One is um, you, can be too, you can be too far ahead in predictions and it doesn't, and the other one is that you never really get your predictions right. But I think um, we saw from last week's seminar that mid-infrared reflecting spectroscopy probably is the way to do much of routine laboratory analysis. And I could stop the seminar there and uh, that, would, that would be enough, I think, but we'll go on. So a little bit of background in soil spectroscopy. I always like a little bit of history. So in the 60s, the work probably began in the 60s. By the 80s, we had the idea of digital spectra and not in soil science, but in chemistry itself, the beginning of what we might call chemometrics and all the techniques that you can use to manipulate spectra. And then probably in the 90s and more like 2000s, we start looking at near infrared, mid infrared uh, spectra of soils and the first work on spectral libraries. And now in the 2010s, 2020s, we're really interested in the potential of field spectroscopy and inference, what can you learn from spectra? So if we go back a little bit in time, no, sorry, let's just talk about the word spectrum. I only, I only put this up because um, I hear people talking about spectra a lot, but they, forget, but they, they don't seem to mention that the, what, the singular word is spectrum. You have, when you take, you take one spectrum or multiple spectra. So it's important that we understand that. And spectral 
it's the adjective that comes from spectrum. Spectrum. So one spectrum, a thousand spectra, a spectral library. So what is what is a spectrum? Well, it's a response, and it could be the reflectance, it could be the absorbance, but it could be something else. Conductivity, permittivity, as a function of some systematic proportion of a continuum. And, and that could be described by its wavelength or its frequency, particularly when we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. And the digital spectrum is the spectrum sampled at fixed wavelengths or frequencies, and then captured as a series of numbers. And it's a, it's a digital spectrum that we work on, and it's a digital spectrum that Chemometrics works on, and that we can store in our databases and we can manipulate. So that's an important concept. The first, I don't know if this is the first spectrum. This is the first spectrum that I know about. Um, this is a visible near infrared reflectance spectrum of a soil, um, Newtonia silt loam. And it's a paper from 1965 in soil science. The purpose of this paper was to understand the energy balance of soils. It wasn't to try and do chemistry, it's actually to try and do physics. And, uh, but what you learn from it is that there are distinct, um, this is a reflectance spectrum, there are distinct bands of absorption, which are largely due to particular moisture contents and OH bonds, but also there's a systematic response to soil moisture. So, um, so that was the first uh, this NIR reflectance spectrum that I know about. And that's, that's actually um, the beginning of that work. We go along, along to about 2006, there's this paper here by my colleague, former PhD student, Raphael uh, Viscara Rossell and Dennis Walbert from uh, the Netherlands, um, from Altera. Um, here we, we looked at the visible, the near infrared and the mid infrared spectrum. Um, and what you see in there is, in, is interesting. The visible doesn't have much fe many features in it. It tells you the soil color, but it doesn't tell you a lot because it doesn't have many features. The near infrared has more features, more, more bands in there. But the mid infrared has a lot more features. It's, it gives you the fundamental frequencies. And that's why, in one sense, the mid infrared is the one that's got the most information for us because it has more features in it. Um, but all, the whole spectrum, you can put the whole spectrum together from the visible to the mid infrared or even from the ultraviolet to the mid infrared. That whole spectrum has got lots of information which you can infer soil properties and soil, soil composition from. And if we go back to last week uh, from Goody's talk, Gooniman's talk, um, we learned there that lots of things that we're interested in for describing soil condition and capacity um, can be um, got at from the mid infrared spectrum. The ones in gold we can do very well, the ones in blue we can do a bit better, the ones in black are more difficult. And, it, and it's those things that are, those properties that are really well described by the solid composition of soil are well estimated. Those that depend on the uh, arrangement of the, those solid materials, and solid and gas and liquid materials, um, like the, the aggregate stability and so on, are not so well predicted. And those things which are dependent on the soil solution are really not that well predicted. So I think we can understand all of that. Uh, but there are other kinds of spectra, like the Raman spectra, the gamma radiometric spectrum, the portable or the X-ray fluorescent spectrum. They all look at different parts of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. The, um, as you can see, the X-ray fluorescent spectrum, which tells you about particular elements, got lots of features in it, 
It's easy to calibrate, hardly needs calibration. A gamma radiometric spectrum, more noisy, but can be calibrated for particular elements or soil properties. The Raman spectrum, once again, tells you about particular uh, spec, uh, particular um, elements, particularly iron, I think. Um, so there are lots and lots, and these these three spectra are for the same for the same soil sample. So, so there are lots of kinds of spectra, and we can even look at the the electric spectrum of a soil. Um, and we can look at the electric spectrum either through its conductivity or through its permittivity or capacitance. As you can see, there are not so many features in this, but we know that systematic changes, if we look at GPR or TDR, these are two methods for measuring soil water, the changes with frequency in GPR and TDR can help us to be able to predict uh, soil moisture distribution. Uh, so, there, there are, there are, there is information in this part of the spectrum. And in fact, if we go back to our 2003 paper that introduced digital soil mapping, we had this diagram, which went through the whole electromagnetic spectrum and talked about all kinds of parts of the spectrum and how they could predict different soil properties and, and allow us to do different relationships. And really, the future's about investigating in detail the whole spectrum here. And it's not just, it's not just the electromagnetic spectrum. We can even have um, a, an acoustic spectrum, which is not part of the electromagnetic spectrum of a soil. This Russian work from a year or two ago, this is the, um, the sound spectrum at different frequencies of a soil. So we can characterize soil particularly soil structure, I think, using the acoustic spectrum. Um, I think the point is that there are many new kinds of soil spectra that remain to be explored. So that's one of the messages from, from today. Uh, there's much to be done with all kinds of soil spectra. And N NIR and MIR are very good and are very useful. But there are many others. So now, now I want to move on to this soil idea about soil spectral inference. So what are we, what are we talking about? It, they're not common words, perhaps. So soil inference is the prediction of a property or properties from other soil property, from another soil property or properties. And the way we've done that over the last 25, 30 years is through what we call pedotransfer transfer functions. Things that are difficult to measure we, we tend to use pedotransfer functions to do that. And doing that, I call soil inference. And soil spectral inference then, is the prediction of properties or other soil properties it, it, from using the spectrum as the input or from properties predicted from the spectrum. So there, in one step, it's direct, in two steps, it's indirect. And a soil inference system is a software engine, a bit of software for the prediction of properties from other soil properties. And a spectral inference system is an, uh, a, soil, a software engine for the prediction of properties where the input is a spectrum, which drives the prediction of other properties. Uh, we can simplify the definition a soil inference system driven solely or mainly from soil spectra, which I think is the promise for the future. And back in 2006, actually, we wrote a little paper about the possibility of using uh, spectra as the main driver for soil inference system. But it's a combination of spectra and spectral transfer functions and pedotransfer functions that uh, offers the future. So at this point, um, at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues, Ed Jones and Jose Fedarian. They're both uh, research colleagues here at the University of Sydney, who are going to give you an explanation demonstration of an inference system 
and the soil spectral inference system. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Ed, I think. Okay, thanks, Alex. So while my slides are loading, I'll just explain that today I'm going to give an overview of a specific soil inference system that we call SINFERS or spec SINFERS when we incorporate spectral data. So today I'm going to show you what SINFERS looks like and how it works. And then following that, Jose will give a live demo of our latest SINFERS implementation. So first, following on from Alex's definitions, so SINFERS is a software engine that facilitates systematic prediction of soil properties from other soil properties. And systematic in this sense means methodical in procedure or plan, and that it's marked by thoroughness and regularity. And I'll demonstrate that soon, but just taking a step back, as Alex says, pedotransfer functions, we can't understand SINFERS without understanding these pedotransfer functions or PTFs. For today's talk, a simple definition of a PTF is any function or equation that is able to predict a soil property from other soil properties. PTFs can be simple regression equations, such as the example of the wilting coefficient shown here at the bottom of the screen. And this is the earliest known example of a PTF. It describes the residual water remaining in the soil when a plant starts to wilt. And as we can see, it's a function of the soil's texture. And we can estimate this for all known texture comp combinations as shown on the right. So this is just a simple example to help you understand better. The new PTFs we develop are mainly more complex machine learning models or spectral models. But the main thing to understand is that PTFs are the building blocks of SINFERS. And SINFERS uses these PTFs to build relationships, as Alex said, to predict properties that are difficult to obtain using properties that are easier to obtain. And this is what it looks like when you run SINFERS. So on the left, we have our small input database, and this can be derived from lab measurements or estimates from spectral data. And then we have a pool of PTFs all jumbled up on there. And then on the right is our output with a large amount of output properties. This could be hundreds of columns uh, wide, but importantly, it has quantified uncertainty. When we run SINFERS, it will first identify the input properties that we have. Then it will search through our PTF pool to determine which PTFs can be run using these initial properties. We then execute these PTFs, which gives a new set of properties with quantified uncertainty. In this, the first generation of SINFERS. As this is a dynamic implementation, it will automatically update depending on the PTFs that we have available in the pool. And now after this first generation, we have a large number of available properties, which means new PTFs can be run in the second generation. And here we can start to see we're forming a SINFERS network, which is a network of properties connected by PTFs. And when we start to make predictions on predictions on predictions, you'll start to understand why it's important to quantify the uncertainty of the prediction and propagate this correctly through the network. So we keep iterating through generations like this until there are no more PTFs that can be executed and our output is returned. You could also overlay additional analyses on top of this output as part of an expert system to make further inferences on the data, but that's the subject for another talk. So we can see that SINFERS is all about knowledge organization. It can be used for the description, indexing, and classification of soil data. Oftentimes, the prediction component can seem trivial. So if we take this example of uh, this simple PTF in the box, I think anyone could calculate this in Excel. But what happens when we add uncertainty to the equation? The calculation becomes non-trivial. And as demonstrated before, when we start linking PTFs in the SINFERS network and make predictions on predictions, the uncertainty propagation is extremely important as it will determine the quality of your final prediction. And the quality of your prediction will, term, will determine its usefulness for different purposes. And what are some of the uses of SINFERS? So the most obvious use case for SINFERS is that it provides a very low cost method 
to turn a small amount of soil data into a large amount of soil data. You can also backfill missing data points. And I'm sure we've already all experienced this when we receive a data set riddled with NAs. Don't you hate that? But you can use SINFUs to provide estimates of these missing values with quantified uncertainty and get all of the additional properties as a bonus. You can also estimate properties that are difficult, expensive, or impossible to obtain. And I mean, by impossible, I mean if a property, if, if a soil sample has been lost or used up, and there isn't enough remaining for a particular analysis. You can also estimate complex and obscure properties, such as the real and imaginary components of the dielectric constants of free water, or the integral energy of the soil moisture characteristic, which is an estimate of the total energy required to extract water from field capacity down to wilting point. So try asking a student or a commercial lab to do that for you. And I don't think they'll be too impressed, but with SINFUs, it's easy. As part of this work, we've been digging through literature to resurrect old and overlooked PTFs. Are all of these properties going to be useful? Maybe not, but with SIMFAs, we're making it easy and accessible to put this information into people's hands so that they can quickly find out for themselves. And who knows what hidden gems there might be out there that might inspire further research streams. So I know this, all, this seminar series is all about spectral analysis and SINFAS is perfectly structured to be combined with spectral soil analysis in the form of a spectral soil inference system or spec SINFAS. And why is that? As Buddy demonstrated last week, you can predict a wide range of properties using spectral data, which means that you can use this data to initiate SINFAS. This allows you to leverage the vast amount of information stored in both PTFs and soil spectra. Further, more importantly, as Buddy demonstrated last, also demonstrated last week, spectral data can be obtained in the field, meaning results from spec SINFAs can also be obtained in the field, and you can use these results to make decisions in the field. With a little bit of development, this can occur quickly, cheaply, and efficiently. So we've actually been working on this behind the scenes for quite some years. An initial implementation was constructed in a large Excel file, which was functional. But as you can imagine, the structure of an Excel file is quite rigid and it's difficult to maintain as new PTFs become available. It's also difficult to incorporate machine learning models. Grant Trantner and Jason Morris, two PhD students here at Sydney, produced dynamic implementations. And I even produced the spec synthesis, spec synthesis system in R as part of my PhD research. But they never really left our computers to be released onto the world. Our latest implementation provides APIs for connectivity with Python and R, or can also be run directly on a web interface to make it more accessible to everyone. And now I'll hand over to Jose to expand on our current implementation and give a live demonstration. Jose. Thanks, Ed. Hope you can hear me. Let's see. So I'm going to give you a short overview of our current implementation of uh, SIMFERS and some examples, uh, interactive examples. This is not loading for a reason. Can you see my screen? I hope so. Um, so this is like uh, Ed already mentioned the, uh, a little bit how SINFER works. So we have some input data and we match all that information with uh, our pool of properties and their transfer functions to make all the predictions and uncertainty propagation. Of course, this input data could be soil uh, properties or could be directly uh, soil spectra. So I'm gonna show you a little bit some of the requirements that we have for different soil properties. Um, so starting first with the soil properties, we have um, here we have a little example that you can see some of the information that we require for each of the soil properties. So you can see things like description units um, and with their specific names on sometimes phys physical constraints, uh, basically to organize all the information that we need to, to run uh, SIMFERS. Uh, probably the most important 
piece of information that we have here. It's uh, each property is linked to a laboratory code. In this particular example, we have a code from the soil chemical methods from Australasia. Um, but we can also have some other laboratory methods there uh, in case two different laboratory codes uh, pointing to the same soil property. Of course, this is very important in the context of a, a global laboratory network, because of course, in many countries, we have different uh, methods and we would like to use the correct pedal transfer functions to predict using the correct uh, properties, obviously. The next um, thing that I want to show you is like the structure of a pedal transfer function. Uh, as you can see here on, on the right, uh, screenshot. We have a lot of information as well, uh, including statistics uh, that we can obtain when we're developing the pedal transfer functions. Um, we have the target properties and the predictors that we can use for this specific pedal transfer function. And as you can see here, they are linked directly to a specific laboratory code to make sure that we use the right uh, property. Um, and for the, for the prediction, we have different uh, requirements. In the case of traditional pedal transfer functions, we have things uh, like, an, uh, like an expression, an uh, arithmetic expression uh, with the corresponding uh, codes. And um, we have, an, in the case of more complicated models like spectral models, we have uh, machine learning uh, methods or deep learning models uh, that will depend, uh, that will be directly linked to certain instrument model. Another requirement that we have, like Ed mentioned before, is uh, that they have uh, different, we have support for different uncertainty uh, propagation methods that will depend on the pedal transfer function that we're using. Um, so here what I'm going to show you is a small demo uh, of different clients that we can connect to Simfers. So Simfer is like the computing engine. We've created an API to, to connect the engine with many different types of clients, including uh, R, Python, or like a web page uh, interface. And I'll show you an example now of, uh, of a Python example. Just to make sure, uh, you, can, you, can you see the screen and the code? Hello, anyone? Yes, we can hear. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Yeah, I thought the connection dropped. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm just gonna load some, this is a Python interface. Uh, and just to have like a really relatively small example here, we're just gonna have a simple table with, with two solid properties, in this case, sand and clay, uh, and just two samples. So of course we can inspect all the different um, all the different information that we have in Simfers. And this is just like a, like a quick view of the API. This is just made to like for developers to inspect it. But I can show you here that we have like a long list of pedal transfer functions. And if we click in any of these pedal transfer function, obviously we can get the details, including the predictors and targets. So we're gonna use this specific pedal transfer function that has a unique identifier within our database to make uh, certain predictions. Uh, so we have the data with those two solid properties, clay and uh, sand. And if we run this using the specific pedal transfer function, in this case, we're predicting uh, field capacity. And you can see here, we have the predictions plus the uncertainty. We can also do the same with, a, this is another pedal transfer function to predict uh, the permanent uh, wilting point. You can also see the predictions and the uncertainty. And we build uh, things first um, in certain way to, that we can easily propagate this uncertainty. So let's say we want to calculate the, um, the available water content of a soil. It will be uh, subtracting um, from the field capacity, the permanent wilting point. And if we do that, we get a prediction. And most importantly, we have like an automatic propagation of the uncertainty. Of course, here I'm just showing you like how to use single pedal transfer functions, but I really want to use this in the like the whole uh, inference system. So using 
Uh, just to remind you, we have just two columns, sand and clay. Those are the initial uh, properties in this case. And we can uh, query the database that we have to see what kind of predictions we can make with Symphors. So we run this and you can see here that uh, starting from, from the top, we have two properties, sand and clay, and we can predict in the first generation that Ed already explained how this works. We can predict a series of nine different salt properties. And then in the following generations, we can use like those predictions and the initial data to make more uh, predictions. For instance, here we have available water content that uh, depends on um, field capacity and uh, the permanent wilting point. Of course, here we just have the, the plot of this, but we can just upload all this data to the Synfra engine and get uh, some response. So if we actually use the initial data that we have and we um, send the, a request to Synfra, we get back all the information that was shown here in the, in the previous graph. So we have the two initial uh, properties, and then we have a series of uh, soil properties that have been predicted in, in different generations with their estimates uh, of uncertainty. Of course, this is starting just from two soil properties that probably we can obtain in, in the laboratory, but it, like here we're talking about, of course, the spectral inference and why uh, using a spectra could be an ideal case in this uh, in a soil inference system is because we can predict like many soil properties from a single uh, uh, spectrum. In this case, we have linked a model, like a machine learning model, specifically a deep learning uh, a convolutional neural network to predict multiple properties simultaneously. So we're starting for, from a single uh, instrument, the, read, the, the reading of this instrument, AgriSpec, we can obtain uh, six different properties, including total nitrogen, clay content, pH, and so on with, with different levels of uh, accuracy. And from those property, then we can use that as a, like uh, in last, the first generation of Synfers and predict multiple salt properties. Here, may, you may see like uh, there's a difference with the previous uh, graph that I show you. And, uh, we have some properties that are uh, in a different color here in orange. And that means that Synfer has multiple uh, pedal transfer functions um, to predict that specific property. So that's something very important that we wanted, we wanted to include in, in Synfrast because that allows us to mix different models and uh, potentially improve the predictions of, let's say, uh, NIR or MIR uh, predictions. Budiman talked about a series of classifications, uh, like cl class A, B, C, D, depending on how accurate were the, the predictions. And we can potentially use this system to take some of the uh, properties that are poorly uh, predicted to like, a higher uh, category. Of course, this is just a graph and I can show you how it works if we submit this data to, to Synfers. This is just reading some data from uh, a collection of spectra that I have. This is just two samples and you can see here they have the, in the column names, we have the name of the instrument. And if we plot this, you can see that the two uh, spectra. We can set this information to SIM first, like in the same way that we did before, just with the two properties. And we get in the background, this is processing all the machine learning models that we have the back. In this case, is this is NIR data. Uh, and from all that, uh, just a single spectrum that we have, we can get 23 different soil properties. And of course, with their estimates of uh, uncertainty. So this is just like a very small example of how we will use uh, Synfres from, uh, in this case, Python. We have similar things for R if you, if you like programming. Uh, but of course, we're trying to do this in like, uh, to be easy, easily accessible to more people. And we're also planning to create like some sort of website like this one, where you can select like a CSV file with the data. In this case, we have just four soil properties. And by, cl by clicking just here, info, we'll send that information and we get back all the prediction. As you can see, well, these are just a few samples, so we get a response quite quickly. And if we open this, you can see that we have like the initial four soil properties and we get all the predictions that uh, Synfers returned. 
So ideally here we want to, um, to provide like a really good engine, of course, that does all this prediction and uncertainty propagation and an API uh, for other people that is interested in communicating software between the engine and their specific software. And this could be obviously ap applicable to things like uh, collecting data in the field. So you could have like, a, like an Android or an iPhone application that gets information from a field spectrometer and you can connect to the engine of Simfers and get predictions in real time. Uh, so that's the small demonstration of what we've implemented so far. And uh, now the floor is for Alex again, that's gonna talk a little bit about the future of uh, all this. Thanks, uh, Ed and Jose. Can everybody hear me again? Yes? Yes. Yes, good, thank you. Thanks, Ed and Jose. I think that gives a little bit of flavor about where we're headed by, in, by bringing together the idea of uh, spectra and uh, predictions from spectra and uh, um, paratransfer functions, bringing those all together into a spectral inference system. So that's where we're, that's probably the cutting edge of where we're at at the moment. And we're working hard to, to make that a reality. So thanks Ed and Jose for that uh, little glimpse of the future. Um, I can't seem to move on to the next slide yet, but anyway, hopefully it'll, it'll let me do that eventually. No, it's stuck. My slides seem to be stuck. Okay, what can I do? Um, Alex, maybe you can uh, try to stop sharing and then sharing again. Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that and I'll share again. Um, Yes, thank you very much. See, you, you know much more about this than I do. That's fantastic. <laughs> and just, and, and Jose's point at the end was, we can get, we can get various levels of prediction from, from the spectra, but we might be able to improve some of the predictions by bringing in the pedotransfer functions. So it's a combination of the two together that will, might give us a lot more properties and better predictions and um, obviously as somebody asked in the um, in the q a we do need to test the quality of these predictions by actually actually making real measurements to test whether it's working That's, it is it has stuck again um, why is it sticking hmm don't know why it's stuck again. Maybe can you just uh, don't use the full screen for now? Uh, don't do full screen, right? Okay, I'll I'll try again. First time we've had any problems on the. Uh, I'll try one more time. I think it's stuck in full screen. I think that's part of the problem. Um. Let me see. Let's see if we can. Okay. No, it keeps sticking. And I don't know why. If you want, I can share the front here. Um, why did that happen? Why is that happening? Yeah, maybe you can share the. The, the slides, the final slides? I, of course, I've changed them since I sent the ones to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's life. Oh. Um, can, can I, okay, all right. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, just, yeah okay. Okay, can we, can we go back one then, please? This one? 
Yeah, so, I'm going to, so now I'm going to talk about the future. I'm sorry that happened. I don't understand that. Um, and all I was going to say about the future is that I don't know anything more about the future than you guys do, everybody out there. So uh, this, is just my, this is just a few things that I think, but you probably think just as well as I do about the future. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, we, um, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk at the Soil Science Society of America, um, Brady Lecture, and I talked about the uh, digital soil science and beyond. And basically, um, that paper's just been published. And so we look at the diagram on the left. We talked about that we probably think the future will have digitally enabled regenerative soil science. So regenerating soil digitally, digitally enabled extraterrestrial soil science. We'll be doing soil science on Mars or other planets. And we might also have digital soils. In other words, soils embedded with digital devices and digital capability inside the soil itself. Um, so that's what we see as a future of digital soil science. But, but as part of that, if we look on the bottom left here, we have things like Internet of Things sensors, machine learning, robotic measurements. We think that spectroscopy is the best tool to drive um, the generation of information through Internet of Things sensors and robotic measurements in order to drive this new digitally enabled soil science. So spectros spectroscopy is very important for the future of soil science and digital soil science and digital soil management, in fact. Next slide, thank you. So let's just speculate a little bit about routine lab spectroscopy and where that's headed. Um, next slide. Um, So we have laboratory spectroscopy, and I guess to do laboratory spectroscopy, the idea is to do it on whole soil samples, not to have to separate, extract, and so on. And we have a whole set of techniques at the moment that we can use for whole soil samples, like the UV, VIS, NIR, MIR, XRF, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, laser-induced fluorescence spectroscopy, Raman, etc. And I think there's a couple of issues that for all of these that we have to be concerned about, sample preparation and calibration. And these are the issues that people have been working on for NIR and MIR for the last few years. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of sample preparation, it does get back to the mundane questions of the do you have to dry the sample or, or how, do you have, how much do you have to dry the sample? Does that have an impact on the spectrum? And grinding the size of the sample, the size of the material, does it matter how big the material is that's presented to the spec, spectrometer? And we know, we know from experience that MIR is more, much more expensive um, sensitive to sample size or so, so the, the size of the material. So we tend to grind it much finer than we do for NIR. Um, and so that question remains for some of the others. I think so. Um, these are two issues that need to be systematically experimented for all of these different new kinds of spectroscopy. Because we think that these other methods will also add information uh, in generating soil. And of course, the advantage of spectroscopy is once you prepare the sample, it's non-destructive, except for LIBS. LIBS has obviously got a bit of dest destructiveness to it. Um, you can put it in other spectrometers and get further information. Next slide, please. 
Uh, sorry, uh, Jose, can you please uh, mute yourself? I guess you are busy replying questions. Okay, good, thanks. And then the course is the, the whole issue about calibration and that will be discussed more in the next uh, few, semi few webinars coming up. But really the questions really come down to how local do you want the, the uh, calibrations to be or how global do you want them to be? And that there's always some balance between local. You, want, you would like them to be local because they predict better. You might want them to be global because you can use them anywhere. They might not be quite as good, but you can use them anywhere. But then how many observations do you need to make local or global calibrations? And the answer is probably not 10 or 100, more like 1,000 or 10,000. And that's one of the issues that we have to do more work on calibration. And we have to, devo we have to develop calibrations for these new kinds of spectroscopy. Next slide. And then the, the bigger promise for the future is, can we do routine field spectroscopy? So if we, if we go to the next slide. Um, now, why would you do routine field spectroscopy as opposed to doing it in the lab? And the, the answer is, and, and doing it in the lab because you've got more control conditions might give you a more precise result. But the, there is a principle here that often analytical chemists don't appreciate, but field soil scientists do appreciate. But when you have real and significant natural soil variation, in other words, the soil itself varies across the landscape, across a field. If you have low cost, low precision soil data generated say from a spectrometer, and we can do that at lots of places, that can produce much higher value spatialized soil information. In other words, I can, if I can take for the same cost 50 observations with a spectrometer and a spectral transfer function or two observations by taking that back to the lab and measuring it for the same cost, I can make a much better map with the field observations than I can with the lab observation. That's the beauty and the promise of particularly field spectroscopy. And I say spectroscopy is, is one way, probably the best way of generating such data. The next slide, please. And so there, there are so many possibilities with field spectroscopy when we start thinking about it. And at the moment we have things like gamma radiometrics, ground penetrating radar, NIR, XRF, MIR to some degree, it's, it's more sensitive in the field, things like LIBS and so on. These can all be um, used in the field, we believe, in the future. Um, the, soil, the soil moisture effect, that there, so the, the, the issues that we have to deal with here, soil moisture effect, how to present the sample, the calibration, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes, we're going to share the recording, don't worry. The recording is going to mainly be Alex saying, next slide, please. But be, in between those, there'll be a few bits of information, I hope. Um, so the soil moisture effect is, soil moisture is likely to offer the most interference in, in, in most of these devices, but it depends. Uh, for example, with gamma radiometric soil moisture affects the radi affects the observations much affects the spectrum much less than it does, for example, uh, NIR. So th there are different effects, and also for XRF, you can it, it affects it less also. But we can remove the moisture effect using various algorithmic uh, techniques. So things like direct standardization or 
um, empirical parameter or solvinalization. So there are techniques for doing that. The fancy words don't matter, but there are techniques to remove the soil moisture effect. Next slide, please. Yeah. And then, of course, the sample presentation is a question of, even though we're in the field, can we actually put the spectrometer in front of the soil, either in situ, exactly where it is, or do we move it around a little bit to bring it closer to the spectrometer? So there's a couple of questions there. Do we need to homogenize the material in any way to make it easier to take the spectrum, or can we do it at, on a undis completely undisturbed uh, bit of soil? Um, and how are we going to look at it? Are we going to do it laterally? In other words, um, look at the spectrum, pull the spectroscope laterally through the soil, or perhaps push it vertically into the soil. Um, agronomists like the lateral, pedologists like the vertical, but um, both are a, both are a possibility and need to be looked at in terms of how we how we, the mode of operation. Next slide, please. Calibration similar to the lab, but a bit more challenging because there's much more variability in the field. The conditions can't be quite as standardized. And I think I would answer the question when it comes to calibration of these field devices, is global calibration feasible? Can we actually ever get enough information to get a global calibration? And is it actually useful? So there are some questions about um, calibration of field spectroscopy, I think. Next slide, please. And then there's mobilization. How, how you put, in what, what kind of mode should we use this, these devices? Obviously the easiest is as a vertical probe that you push down into the soil, but we could mount that probe on an autonomous vehicle. It can drive around and do the thing automatically. We could put it on a very low flying aircraft. Um, and we could do it as an endochoric soil probe. Endochoric, which is a word I made up yesterday, means um, inside, this, inside the volume of the soil itself. In other words, it operates inside the soil. So next slide. So here's an example of a low flying aircraft flying about 30 centimeters above the soil surface with an EM induction device. This thing only has a few channels, but there's no reason why this couldn't, we couldn't have a similar device that produced full spectra in the electro, in, in the um, radio frequency part of the, the spectrum flying over the soil, taking spectra. Um, this one is very useful for mapping soil moisture. Next slide. Next slide, please. Ye. And oh, you can, you can yeah. see. Can you see? Because the, the previous slide should be the this one. I think there was a slide. Yeah, th this little thing, it's just an imaginary thing of a spectrometer that crawls through the soil by itself and takes spectra, but it might also be di diverted to actually make some changes to the structure of the soil or, or such a device. So that's kind of way into the future kind of idea. But that's when I, what I call the endochoric device. Now, if we get on to... Um, the interface between chem chemometrics and pedometrics, between the, the soil statistics and the, the statistics of the um, spectroscopy. Next slide. This is all, the whole question about spectral data sharing and calibration, which you're going to talk about in the future. Um, sl next slide.
think we'll go to the next one. So a couple of years ago, a lot last year, Jose, uh, Jose particularly wrote a paper about what's a good model for sharing data. Um, and in, in this case, in the case that we're talking about, sharing soil spectra or sharing soil samples from which soil spectra can be derived. And uh, we do understand, I think everybody understands that the sharing of spectra, the sharing of data is, offers difficulties to institutions these days. And we need to think about methods that allow us to share data and learn from them, but not have that data in the control necessarily of a, of a centralized body or a cent centralized institution. So I think we're moving away from that idea. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, I found this paper published recently in Nature, which talks about the same problem, but in the context of um, doing diagnosis using um, DNA sequencing. But the same thing applies and where people are working in all over the world. Uh, but here we, we could change the, the little DNA type um, uh, icons there for spectra. So I think they're about spectra and the little squares with spikes on there. You can think about that as the, the spectral models, the, which are the diagnosis. So you get spectral models and you got spectra. And so if we think about it in that way, we can think about different modes of learning Local learning, that's all of us sitting in our labs making little pedo transfer, little spectral uh, libraries for our, own, for our own lab and making spectral transfer functions or calibration functions individually. They might work locally, but they won't work in other places. Because all of us have a few data, they might not have the power of prediction. The complete opposite of that is Central learning, central learning where all, where all the um, where all the um, all the spectra are put into a, a central location, which is probably the idea that the uh, Glossolan has for making spectral libraries at the moment. Not necessarily. It's a method of present, but not necessarily the method of the future. Everybody has to hand over their spectra and their samples. Next slide. So that's the current way of making spectral libraries. Uh, next slide. Um, and then there are other ways of federated learning where everybody sends in their spectra, uh, sends in their, their spectral models and you make universal models from the different spectral models. That's, in that case, you don't, don't ever hand over your data to anybody, but you make a, a federated spectral model. And I don't think that's been tried at all. And I think that's a good way for us to investigate in Glossolan. To me, that would be a, actually a very good thing to do. And then the last one is swarm learning, where you, you still locally uh, do the, um, the the functions, but you do um, some some of the data and and uh, spectral functions do in an in an anonymous way get transferred between each other, and I think that that's the future for generating uh, spectral transfer functions or calibration functions. So that's the future way of making spectral libraries. So. I think there's a big future in this kind of data sharing approach without the centralized institution, which is a kind of old fashioned model, I think, for doing this kind of work. Um, next slide, please. So the, uh, the other thing I, I, I'm very passionate about is using spectra for soil classification and identification. Next slide. I think the biggest challenge um, for the future in which soil spectroscopy can play a crucial, crucial role. 
So it's a big challenge and spectroscopy can help a lot is to have a formal digital global quantitative system of soil classification. We don't have it. The WRB soil taxonomy is not that. It's not, it's not, it's not global, it's not digital, and it's not quantitative. And uh, we really need this if we're going to develop soil, soil understanding and soil management. Next slide. And of course, so we've been working on some example and um, my updated slides had a reference here, but there are 23 soil variables that we can est that we can use to do a global system. And most of these, if not all of them, are derivable in the field or lab from MIR or NIR soil spectra. So we can really get at most of the information that we need for soil classification um, from the spectra. Next slide, please. And this is an example of putting together uh, taxa from different systems here, soil taxonomy, WRB, Australian Soil Classification, New Zealand. But this could be taxa from all of your systems and all of your national systems could be in the same system. And you can see how they relate to the taxa of other countries and so on. And we could do all of this, put it all together and using spectroscopy as the way of generating the data. So I think that's very much the future. So I hope you, you all take up the mantle of a global digital soil classification system using spectroscopy. Next slide, please. So there are a few dangers in spectroscopy and they, they're worth mentioning um, on the way through. So if we go to the next slide, um, obviously everybody's having a look at machine learning and deep learning. We're not really using artificial intelligence at the moment, but we're certainly using machine learning and deep learning. Next slide. And really the question I have um, is really about the interpretation of machine learned soil spectral prediction models. Can we interpret the models? So if we look at these models, can we interpret what they're telling us? And if we can't interpret the models, do, what do we understand about the relationship between the spectra and the soil properties? So that's not just a philosophical question, it's a, it's a scientific question. And I think we need to think deeply about that question. Next slide. The next issue is about proprietary soil prediction. So we see on this slide thing, words like ag tech, soil tech, end tech. There's lots of startups or small companies out there offering new, new ways of doing things. And one of the new ways of doing things is to, to, to more cheaply predict soil properties, which is fine, but um, if we're, if we're going to use those services rather than have our own laboratories or make our own measurements, we do need to understand how they're doing it and what the uncertainties are. So, and that, so this is what I call proprietary soil prediction, soil prediction made by companies. Proprietary means that the way they do it is the, is the intellectual property of the company. So you don't actually know how they do it. Whereas if you make a pH measurement in the lab, everybody knows how you do it. So next slide. So do we need to know what's inside the black box? This is what might be inside the black box. We, but we, do we need to know what it is? Does it make sense? So if we're going to go down the road of proprietary soil prediction, I think as soil scientists, we do need to have some understanding of what's inside the black box. And we certainly need to be able to know how well these things are actually measuring or predicting soil properties. So we have to be very careful about proprietary soil prediction. It may be that it's not proprietary, that the whole thing is open, and that's fine, no problem. Next slide. And then the last one I talked about is doing too much with too little. 
In other words, we read lots of papers where people have collected 50 samples, collected spectra of hundreds of wave bands, and then fit a model with 50 observations and hundreds of wave bands. And then they fit a model that's got hundreds of parameters to predict pH or something else. The problem with that is, or it might be for predicting the plastic microplastic content in soils. We have to be worried about overfitting or overstretching the data because spectral predictions calibrated with too few observations are not predictive at all. They might fit very well, but when you come to bring new material, you get the wrong answer. It's a, so there's a, it, 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 it's a kind of false, Dawn, you know, you think you've done well, but when you go to predict, it doesn't work. And spectral predictions using calibration models with too many parameters are also not predictive. That's why when we do predictions, at least in our lab, we always have, um, we, we put observations to the side to see how well they predict. We don't believe just in bootstrapping and cross validation is a way of telling you how well the model actually works. So doing too much with too little is a real problem. So I'm, I'm sounding all very negative now. I'm not negative about soil spectroscopy. I think it really is the future for digital soil science. Um, and um, let me go to the next slide. So let me do some conclusions, which hopefully are a bit more positive. There are many kinds of spectroscopy that are potentially useful for the re rapid generation of soil information on whole soil. And may, but at the moment, many of those are largely uninvestigated. So those of you who are looking for a project for the future, there are many projects for the future in the talk that I've given you today that you can investigate. Um, many kinds of spectroscopy that you can investigate and uh, write many nice papers about. Um, next slide. Um, at the moment, mid-infrared, near-infrared, portable X-ray fluorescence and gamma radiometrics are the most deployable uh, kinds of spectroscopy for the whole soil. And they're both useful in the lab and in the field. So these are the methods for the moment. So if you, if you want to get started doing something and you want to use it to actually generate real data, then I would be looking at one of these methods. I, I should say, if you, you do better if you put them all together. I don't favor one over the other. I would prefer to use all of them and get bits and pieces of information from all of them by putting it all together. Next slide, please. Um, we, I believe that soil spectral inference systems will be the principal um, mode of operation. So putting together the calibration equations, the spectral transfer functions with the pedo transfer functions will be, will be the way we do this. And this will be applicable to both laboratory and field-based systems. So you'll put in the soil, you'll collect one or two, two different kinds of spectra, and it will really tell you about 200 soil properties with their uncertainty. Um, and if they're very uncertain, then you might go and say, well, we've got to go and measure that. But that's, a, that's how we feed the, the soil information systems of the future. Next slide, please. In the laboratory, calibration will, will be developed for many hundreds of soil properties using federated and swarm learning. I, I see the federated and swarm learning as a way to generate calibrations in the future, which means that you will be you will be collaborating with labs across the world, but you won't necessarily be sending all your data there. You'll be doing it in, in a more anonymous way using the, um, the idea of the blockchain. Next slide. In the field, spectrometers of various kinds will be 
deployed on autonomous platforms to update the wide array of dynamic soil properties important for monitoring soil condition or health to help us better manage soil. Next slide. Principal applications will be for real-time agronomic and environmental decision-making, but also including soil classification and diagnosis and soil monitoring. That's the end of the conclusions. Go to the next slide, please. Um, just a little ad advertisement since I'm here. Um, if you'd like to say something new, um, I would like to hear about it. So we have a new journal called Soil Security. Um, so if you're interested in publishing some of your work um, around soil security, soil health, soil conditions, soil capability, soil connectivity, the capital of soil, uh, soil awareness, and so on, soil governance, this is a journal for you. All the sort of things that Global Soil Partnership works on, we publish in soil security. It's multidisciplinary, it's not just science, it's also got economics and sociology in there. We're, but we are currently developing a special issue on soil spectroscopy for estimating soil condition and capability. And Alex Wadu is looking for paper. So if you'd like to write to him, um, please do that. Uh, next slide. I mean, this, we're doing advertisements now. Um, we've got a training course coming soon, with, with, which is based on this book, Soil Spectral Inference with R, that we published earlier in the year. Alex Wadu is creating the training course um, and it'll be hosted. We are creating it here at Sydney and it'll be hosted by a, a Glossolan coming soon, hopefully this year, if not early in the next year. We have had the problem that we've been locked down and haven't been able to get to some of our equipment and devices and laboratories and rooms. So that slowed us down a little bit. Next slide, thank you. And uh, just reminding everybody, all you soil scientists out there, the peak body for the world soil scientists is the International Union of soil sciences. I'm very passionate about the International Union of Soil Sciences. And just to remind everybody, next slide, that next year will be the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow. And I hope you've got some nice papers about soil spectroscopy um, that you want to give there. Uh, I'm particularly passionate about that because some of you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm actually originally from Scotland myself. So uh, after COP26 the, um, and, and climate change, there's the IUSS Congress in Glasgow. Uh, so I'll see you there. Next slide. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. I'm sorry the slides wouldn't feed through, but hopefully um, you, could, you still got the gist of everything I said. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. I I think it's a great presentation. I enjoyed a lot. I have to say every time I always enjoy it and get inspired every time when I listen your talk, especially your, your vision. It's really inspired our uh, young generation. And uh, we have uh, quite a couple of questions uh, I would like you to answer live, but before I answer the questions from the participants, I think that I would like to take some advantage of for myself as a moderator, ask a, one question from myself, from my perspective. Uh, like what I said just now, I get inspired a lot. Actually, I have a lot of questions, but uh, since uh, uh, I guess I, I should only ask one question, so I, I, I would like to ask a very generic question. Just now you may, uh, mentioned the one thing about the use uh, spectral information for the soil classification purposes, which is very interesting for me. And yeah. uh, as you know, um, we are, most of us are trained as a pathologist. Uh, we often went to the field, uh, uh, spend hours for the classifying the soil, soil profile and which is a kind of fun. And uh, 
those discussions actually are main input for the soil classification work. Uh, and now, uh, but that's also uh, raised the problem because uh, different country has a different system for the classification system. For example, Australia has your system, US has US system, FAO has a kind of the international system. That's uh, become to a major barrier of the harmonizing the soil types. So spectroscopy, spectral information involving is definitely one of the solution for in the future if we can we can have uh, harmonized uh, the classification system. That's uh, definitely the way to, uh, to, to go ahead. But the, the thing is, uh, one thing is, uh, my question is, uh, in the future, if we use a lot of uh, spectral information for this purpose, which means we give a lot of job to the computer to do it. And that time I would like to listen your opinion in the future if that day really happens. That because uh, uh, so far we use a lot of uh, expertise from our soil scientists for the soil classification. But in the future, when the day comes, a lot of work gives to the computer. The role of the soil scientist and this expertise, uh, what kind of role will be in this domain? Because uh, I think it's quite important and nowadays, many young generation playing with the computer, uh, uh, very good with the programming, but they go to the field, they can, <laughs> classify the profiles. So I would like to listen your opinion about that. Yeah, it's an, it's a, it's an interesting question. And, uh, um, but at the moment, I think we have a failure. We have a failure of, system, of a system because basically we are using, we're using classifications. The, the principles and the way we do classification is from the 1950s and we haven't changed that. And what I'm saying is, we need to change that. We need we, we need to make it quantitative. Now, um, and of course, when you go to the field to do classification, even with something like uh, soil taxonomy or WRB, many times you you say, "Oh, I can't do this class. I can't do this classification because I need to send this sample to the laboratory to tell me how much clay is here, or because the criteria." use some some measurement um, so um, I think in the future all of that measurement stuff should be able to be done in the field but the other thing is um, be, we we only look at some properties and we don't use other properties and I think when we can use spectroscopy we can use a lot more uh, properties and we can put them together and we've already demonstrated that you can bring different systems together by understanding the taxa and bringing them together into a single system. And it can apply to, to taxa from every, from every classification system. So I think that's the great thing for the future. So you go to the field, you, you, you stick the, the spectroscope, you get the data, you, you, and then it, it will automatically uh, tell you which kind of soil this is. But, but you must be able to, to read the data and say, oh, this is not telling me the right thing. This is not giving me the right answer. You need to be able to understand that. But I think it also then allows you to think a little bit less about what is this soil, but more about how did this soil get here? How are we going to manage this soil? We can change the focus of what we do. Thank you. Thank we you. We change very much. the focus of what we try to do. Okay. We, we don't get we don't stop at the first step where we have 10 people having an argument about what, what we call this soil. Thank you. I've, I've seen it many times. I um, anyway. Um, I, I know every. I know not everyone will agree with me about what I said, but it's kind of heading in the, in in that direction. And I think it's. I think we should try and do do that, and it will take us further. I've got no doubt. Yeah. I've got no doubt. Probably we can we can even write a paper together for this. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. I think there are still a couple of questions from uh, from the uh, participants. 
And uh, I think you can see the question from the QA session, uh, but I will try to read it out because the recording later will not show the text. So later on, the other uh, colleagues can know the question. The first question is for uh, just a cu curiosity. Will soil spectroscopy technology be as simple as using smartphone, meaning at the rural farmer's level in future, so that we take a picture or scan and get the information directly for example, fertilizer recommendation, those the liming quantity, etc. Yeah, it's a good question, and I guess it's the it's the dream of the agronomist to be able to do that. Um, I think in terms of technology, yes, but we do still have to solve the problem about the fact that how do we get information about the soil solution? Um, so we haven't really solved that problem yet, you know. We we can we can tell something about the total amount of of, of soil uh, of elements and so on, but we can't really tell about its activity, how active it is, and that's what's important for fertilizer recommendation. So we still we still will need some tricks. We'll need to invent some new technology to allow us to do that. But I believe we will invent that technology. And yes, I believe it will be coming from a, a, smart, a smartphone type device, yes. I mean, it's, it's quite easy to, to turn a smartphone into at least a visible spectrometer now. If you take this, this device and you, and, you, and you make some solution and you shine a light through it, you can measure you can measure the um, absorbance of a solution very simply with a smartphone now by just putting a cradle on the back of this smartphone. So you could do that already. So it's not so it's not so far in the future, I think. Okay. Um, and and probably spectra spectrometers will be built in. They won't just be visible. They'll be also be in the uh, near infrared as well. Thank you. Oh, by the way, actually, this question was asked by the, I think this question was asked by the brother of the Cabindo. Okay, then. <laughs> good, good. Uh, the second question is, uh, could we use a uh, for prediction of level of a biodiversity? If no, could you tell about the investigation in this area, relationship between biodiversity level and a spectrum, please? Yeah, I, I can't answer this one very well. Um, uh, I wish Mario was here because we have done some, we have done some work on that. So there, are, there is some relationship between spectra and biodiversity that which we have observed. We have observed some relationships, um, but uh, I don't know. I, I I would put them in the in the range of um, reasonably to poorly predicted, not very well predicted biodiversity. But it, I guess what the relationship is to do with the organic material, the different kinds of organic material that you see in soil and its relationship to bacteria, fungi, and so on. So there is some relationship, but not, not so far a very strong one. And, um, but we have we have looked we have tried to look at that because we're we're interested in um, in in what drives soil biodiversity what what controls soil biodiversity is it, is it something that you can control easily by management for example and at the moment the measurement of soil biodiversity requires. Um, a fair bit of work in terms of DNA extraction and then gene sequencing. So there's a, and a lot, a lot of algorithmic work in interpreting the, the, the gene sequences. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions is also from previous uh, during your talk. One uh, colleague asked, what is your opinion on using current available remote sensing 
data or method for assessing soil properties? Because I think this is a question from many colleagues and- uh, Right, okay, and then, so this is, this, is, this is one of the easier questions. Can you guess what I'm going to say? <laughs> so, so lo lots of remote sensing methods, particularly those that work in the, vi the visible near infrared, um, visible near infrared. And remember, when you talk remote sensing, the words that they use for the different parts of the spectrum are different. So when they talk about the thermal infrared, that that's different from what we talk about, the mid infrared and so on. So the language of remote sensing and the language of spectroscopy are different. So you need to remember that. Um, so um, most, of this, most of the methods that look at, uh, let's say the visible and the infrared, all um, basically they measure the top millimeter of the soil because they're, re they're, they're reflectance measurements. They are re reflectance measurements. So if you have a bare field like the one behind Lee's head there, then you can say something about the, the soil properties on the surface. But what does it tell you about the soil at five centimeters or 10 centimeters or 50 centimeters? What's the model for telling you that? You're not measuring that. So that's the first part. So it really only tells you about the soil surface. Now there are some other techniques um, in the radio frequencies that penetrate into the soil. Um, but they, at the moment, they mainly tell you about the moisture content. And that's how we get soil moisture. But they, they only penetrate a few centimeters into the soil. So at the moment, remote sensing is good for making inferences about the soil surface, but not about deeper in the soil. That's remote sensing at the moment. Yes, that's the, that's the, major, that's the major barrier because uh, the reflectance yeah. only can reach the surface information. Even has some problem with the vegetation cover, this uh, noise. Yeah, and, that, and that's not talk, even talking about the vegetation cover, correct. So, you know, I don't, I, I think the, the advantage of spectroscopy is you're going to look directly at the soil at different depths. That's what you're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, is uh, we can get a cheap and quick prediction by spectral technology. How is the cost efficiency compared to the conventional analysis in the lab? Another question is, uh, can we use spectral for soil classification? I think in the second one we already discussed. The first one probably is something generic because uh, the cost uh, is uh, most, one of the most concerned for many labs. Well, if you're only interested in soil pH, then I would buy a pH meter and measure it. And measure it. But if you're interested in um, a range of soil properties, then spectroscopy will give you a whole range of soil properties on the same sample. And the second thing is it's non-destructive. So I think that, you know, um, I think that's the advantage when you when you want a whole range of soil properties. And I think the, the other thing I didn't talk about is, imagine you, you store all these soil, um, and uh, some new, new thing, new property becomes important. So a new contaminant becomes important. And you want to know is the soil of the world contaminated with this material? Or was it contaminated recently or in the past? You take the soil from the, the soil lab, the soil store, you take the spectrum and you make a calibration, then you can map the whole world soil for contaminant contaminants. So it's it's really about the fact that it gives you much more flexibility about what properties you might measure. 
And at the moment, you might want to look at that for plastics in, in all of these, you know, because, the spe because once you've got a calibration for the spectrum, um, you, can look, you can look at the old spectrum and say, what's the plastic there? It's the plastic in this spectrum, for example. You don't need to really go back and do all the samples again. You just need to look at the spectra. That's a kind of advantage. Yeah, I think yeah. Just now, I think that information is quite uh, quite 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 important because the we kind of uh, we can map the the past the baseline map, which means there's opportunity. Yeah, yeah because yeah. if we have an archive from 100 years ago, we can just take it out. And then we get the information from 100 years ago, and then we have a comparison. What is the status now? What, it, what, it, what was 100 years ago? But you can also have the spectra, and then you can, even with spectra that you have now, you can say, well, I can estimate new properties as the, as the, as the calibrations become available. As the calibrations become available, you can redo, relook at the spectra and generate more properties. How much glyphosate is in my soil? How much glyphosate residues in my soil, for example? There is a one important more... question. That's a very important question. Everybody should measure that. Yeah. It's uh, called AMPA, AMPA. Look for AMPA. Okay. Uh, one more question is, uh, say, how can the results obtained from SINFA be validated and can the Peter transfer function be extrapolated from the local to the wider region when applying yeah. this uh, system? Yeah. Well, the, the only way to tell whether the thing's working is to go and is to make some measurements. So I always believe that you should go and take some samples and see whether the whether it's predicting properly. Go and take some new samples and predict. So remember, just to talk to everybody, I'm a soil scientist, I'm not a statistician. I actually believe in that we should go out in the field and collect soil samples and make observations. Do the testing. The sec what was the second part of the question, Yi, please? Uh, the, how, uh, how the Peter trans transfer function be extrapolated from a local to a wider yeah. region. So, so we, what, we, what we have in the system is a, a kind of region of confidence of the pedotransfer function. So we know something about the space in which it's calibrated. And if you go outside the space, the calibration space, then the pedotransfer function either doesn't give you a prediction or gives you a huge uncertainty. So, we already try to recognize that you're trying to use it in a situation where it's not calibrated. That's part of the inference system. At least that's, the, that's what should be in there. I hope it's in there, Jose. <laughs> it is, it is. Don't worry. That's the main bit. <laughs> okay. I think this will be the last question. Our webinar today was quite su successful, almost two hours. People are very interesting. Uh, the okay. last question is that, do you think numeric soil classification is the future and the, for spectroscopy, we can infer soil properties based on spectra and then classify soils in direct way. We can also make a classification directly from spectra, which way is better in your opinion? Okay, good question. And, and we've tried to make classifications directly from the spectra. But I think, I think if you do that, and this goes back to what Yi said earlier, then you deny all the pedological knowledge that we have generated for a hundred years. So we know, we know which soil properties are important. So I think it's better to use the spectra to generate the soil properties that are important and discriminate different kinds of soil and then use those properties to give us the classes. And so I don't necessarily believe that we should go directly from the spectra, make spectra, make classes from spectra without 
soil properties. And I think soil properties is a way of interpreting the soil, the data. We, so, and that's why a lot of the work has to be about calibration, about pedal transfer functions, about inference systems. That's why I talk about inference systems because it's really about getting at the soil properties that we understand. The soil properties and how they operate and the processes is our soil knowledge. We shouldn't throw away the soil knowledge that we have already gained over a hundred years. Thank you, uh, Alex. I think I, I fully agree with you and also uh, uh, that's one of my major concerns because uh, I'm, now I'm in this position and many of the country and many of the partners are asking us for the, for the training, different training, digital soil mapping, spectral modeling. And uh, they always asking the, what kind of uh, algorithm, machine learning, and you uh, can make the good prediction and uh, really mentioned about uh, using our existing soil knowledge to explain the result, explain the, the map. Otherwise, uh, the map is just a beautiful picture and it can be very dangerous for the policymakers actually. Well, when, when, I, when, I, when we do any of this work, how do I judge? How do I judge whether it's useful? Well, I can only judge whether it's useful based on my knowledge of soil. <laughs> That's how I can judge. So we do need that soil knowledge to be able to, to know whether we are doing something useful, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. It's been uh, really, it's been really uh, enjoyable and uh, I inspired a lot from your talk. And uh, Michael, um, I think the you uh, dear all the participants, thanks very much for your for your joining our webinar today, and uh, we will send the email to inform you the we will upload the presentation and the recordings to our website, and we will send you the email to inform you shortly. And my colleague is now posting the link to the other three webinars scheduled on soil spectroscopy. And you are all invited for the, the rest of the sessions. And remember to check this page regularly as well, because there will be more webinars coming, not only for the spectroscopy, also for the wet chemistry and equipment to purchase, et cetera, in the coming months. So, the, so we are really in the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you again for the speaker and the panelists and all the participants. I wish you a pleasant end of the day or the evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thanks for listening and thanks for the questions. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.